So OpenAI just launched ChatGPT Health, where you can link your medical records and wellness apps for personalized guidance. Then they're reportedly training an advanced system that can do real office work end-to-end -end using actual workplace task data. And on top of that, GPT 5.2 just set a new reasoning record on Arc AGI 2 with OpenAI openly talking about capability overhang. Like these models are already ahead of how humans even know to use them. All right, so let's start with the biggest official launch, ChatGPT Health. OpenAI rolled out a dedicated health and wellness experience inside ChatGPT. And the key point here is that it's built as its own separate space not just a regular chat where you ask health questions like you always have. The company is treating health as a core product category now, and you can see why. They say health is already one of the most common reasons people use ChatGPT. And based on de-identified analysis of conversations, OpenAI says over 230 million people globally ask health and wellness questions on ChatGPT every week. That number is insane. That's basically the user base of a major social platform, just asking health questions weekly. So they are turning that demand into a dedicated experience. Here's what actually changes with health. Your health info can finally be connected. Because in real life, health information is scattered. One hospital portal for labs, another for visit notes, maybe a PDF that you downloaded once and forgot about, then Apple Health holding steps and sleep, then MyFitnessPal holding macros, then your wearable app, and everything is disconnected. Health is trying to become the place where all those pieces meet. So users can connect medical records and wellness apps directly into health. The examples they give include Apple Health, MyFitnessPal, and Function. For medical records, OpenAI partnered with Be Well, described as the largest and most secure network of live, connected health data for U.S. consumers so that health can connect to certain U.S. medical record sources. And once the data is connected, you can actually ask higher level questions that need personal context. OpenAI says health helps you feel more informed and more prepared, especially for important medical conversations. So you can interpret test results with more context, prepare for doctor visits, understand trends, or optimize a wellness routine based on your connected data. They even mention insurance decisions, like understanding trade-offs across insurance options, using your healthcare patterns as context. That's not chatbot talk, that's actual decision support territory. Now, OpenAI is taking a very specific stance on what health is meant for. They say it helps people take a more active role in understanding and managing health and wellness. They say it supports everyday questions and long-term patterns, not just moments of illness. They also emphasize clinician collaboration, where this helps the patient show up to appointments prepared. And that focus on preparing and understanding is consistent across the launch coverage too. One write-up even frames it as OpenAI positioning itself as a major player in digital health innovation globally, especially in regions like MENA, where digital health adoption is rising. So yeah, the product direction is clear, OpenAI wants health to become a central tool in personal health management. Now, the biggest part of the health launch is privacy and security. Obviously, this category lives and dies on trust. They built health as a separate compartment inside ChatGPT with additional protections. They use phrases like layered protections, and they get specific. Health uses purpose-built encryption and isolation to keep health conversations protected and compartmentalized. And they make the biggest promise very directly. Health conversations are not used to train OpenAI's foundation models. All right, now quick break for a short detour. If you work with AI a lot and end up jumping between different models just to see which one actually fits a task, today's sponsor Mammoth makes that whole workflow much easier. Mammoth brings most of the major AI models into one place. Claude, GPT, Gemini, Llama, Mistral, Grok, DeepSeek, Perplexity for Deep Research, plus image models like Flux, Nano Banana, and Recraft and everything runs inside a single dashboard. What really helps in day-to-day -day use is the comparison setup. You can send the same prompt to different models at the same time and instantly see how each one responds. That makes it easier to choose the right model for writing, research, analysis, or images without guessing. You can also create custom mammoths, basically your own presets with specific instructions for recurring tasks and keep things organized in projects. On the privacy side, Mammoth is based in Europe with data hosted in Germany, fully GDPR compliant, and models aren't trained on your data. Prompts aren't retained by providers, and you can delete your history whenever you want. Plans start at around 10 euros per month, or roughly $12, and it's already used by hundreds of companies and public institutions. Check it out using the link in the description. All right, now back to the video. They also separate the memory system. Health has separate memories, separate storage for connected apps and files, and it doesn't mix with your normal chats. 
you still see health chats in your history, so you can return to them, but the underlying information stays inside the health space. And OpenAI explains the boundary rules too. They allow non-health context to help health if needed, like lifestyle changes or moving cities. Health context stays inside health and does not flow back into normal chats. Normal chats also can't access health files or health memories. It's built like a one-way door. You also get control. You can view or delete health memories anytime, either inside health or the personalization section of settings. They also mention multi-factor authentication as another layer of protection against unauthorized access. Then there's the question of apps and integrations. OpenAI makes it clear that apps only connect with explicit permission, even if the app already exists in your regular ChatGPT environment. So connecting MyFitnessPal to health isn't automatic. You choose it. They also say any app included inside health has to meet their privacy and security requirements and undergo additional security review. They mention principles like collecting only minimum data needed. And when you connect an app, they guide you through what data the third party may collect. And here's the part that matters for trust. They say you can disconnect an app at any time and it immediately loses access. Same for medical records. You can remove access and settings. Now, OpenAI says they worked with more than 260 physicians across 60 countries, across dozens of specialties, over a period of two years. And the scale of the feedback isn't small. This group provided feedback on model outputs over 600,000 times across 30 areas of focus. This isn't, we asked doctors what they think. This sounds like a full evaluation and reinforcement pipeline, where physician feedback shapes how the system communicates, where it escalates urgency, how it frames advice, and how it prioritizes safety. And to measure all of that, OpenAI built HealthBench, described as a physician-informed assessment framework. They say it evaluates responses using physician-written rubrics that reflect how clinicians judge quality in practice. Safety, clarity, appropriate escalation, respect for context. Now roll out details. It looks like it will be gradual. Early access starts with select users, then expands across web and iOS globally. You can join the waitlist. They also give eligibility rules. Early access is for users on free, Go, Plus, and Pro plans, but it's limited to users outside of the European Economic Area, Switzerland, and the UK. So the EEA and UK regions are excluded from early access, most likely regulation and compliance. Medical record integrations in some apps are US only. Connecting Apple Health requires iOS. They also list what apps exist inside health. They mention Apple Health, Function, MyFitnessPal, Weight Watchers, AllTrails, Instacart, Peloton, and it supports uploading files directly too, including medical records for lab results, visit summaries, clinical history, so that's health. All right, now let's talk about the other side of this because they're also building something that could mess with a lot of office jobs. So OpenAI is developing an advanced system that can handle almost every daily office task and in a lot of cases outperform humans in that category. And they're training it on real office work, real tasks, real deliverables, the full workflow from start to finish. They actually partnered with Handshake AI and they're collecting work data from contractors across multiple professions. And the structure of the data makes the goal pretty obvious. They're collecting two main things, task requests and task deliverables. Task requests are basically the instructions you'd get from a manager or colleague, someone telling you to complete a task. And task deliverables are the finished outputs produced in response, including real formats like Word documents, PDFs, PowerPoint presentations, Excel sheets, and even images. And these aren't tiny tasks. They specifically asked contractors for complex work that takes hours or even days. That detail signals their training systems around long workflows. The kind of work where you start something, pause, come back, refine it, fix mistakes, organize files, then finally deliver a final version. And if that scales properly, you basically get an AI system that operates like a virtual office worker, a workflow machine. Now, obviously, there's a security layer around this. Contractors were told to remove proprietary company information and personally identifiable information before submitting anything. That's the protection layer to prevent sensitive work data from turning into a privacy disaster. And this kind of system hits white collar jobs first. And honestly, that's already happening. This just accelerates it. Administrative work gets squeezed first. Data entry, scheduling, organizing spreadsheets, basic coordination. AI agents are already excellent at repetitive workflow operations at scale. Then, junior content creation and junior coding. 
Companies already do the work of entire teams by combining one senior worker with AI support. That trend is already real, and it gets more intense as systems improve. Customer support gets hit hard too. These systems keep getting more human-like, and once they're trained on real problem-solving workflows, they learn how complaints get handled, how escalation works, how people explain issues, and how to deal with messy human communication without breaking. Legal work gets affected on the junior side too. Reading legal documents, extracting key points, research, drafting, AI compresses that time massively. Finance and accounting get squeezed as well. Bookkeeping, tax calculations, auditing support. Firms already use AI tools at scale, which reduces the need for basic accounting roles. And at the end of the day, the takeaway stays simple. The people who learn how to use these systems properly become dramatically more productive than the people who don't. So learning the tools becomes part of the job. Soft skills like leadership and negotiation become more valuable. Critical thinking becomes mandatory because AI can still make mistakes and confident errors. And the biggest part is staying adaptive because this entire space keeps shifting every six months. All right, now the third part of this is where the AGI conversation gets spicy again. Greg Brockman posted that GPT 5.2 beat the human baseline on ArcAGI 2, and that's a big deal because ArcAGI 2 is built to expose one of the biggest weaknesses of large models. It stands for Abstraction and Reasoning Corpus for Artificial General Intelligence, version 2, and it was designed as a reasoning test that doesn't reward memorizing patterns. Each puzzle is basically treated like a new task, so you can't just grind a huge training set and brute force your way to a high score. The whole point is to test abstract reasoning, induction, and transfer everyone, the stuff people associate with real general intelligence. Francois Chollet and his team launched ArcAGI 2 in 2025 with that exact purpose in mind. Chollet has said many times that if a system only performs well on distributions it has already seen, it doesn't have what's needed for AGI. So Arc doesn't test for who trained on more internet text. It tests for whether the system can figure out a new rule with minimal examples like humans do. And this is also why Arc AGI 2 is now tied to something Ilya Sutskever has talked about a lot the performance paradox. Models can look insane on benchmarks and still fall apart in real-world situations. Arc AGI 2 tries to cut through that by forcing models to deal with unfamiliar tasks where pattern matching doesn't carry as hard. Now here's where it gets even crazier. The record jump wasn't just one model getting better. A system called Poetik, built on GPT 5.2x high, pushed Arc AAGI 2 performance way past what people expected. Poetik hit 75% accuracy on Arc AGI 2 while keeping the cost under $8 per question, and that was 15 percentage points above the previous best score. And the interesting part is how that score compares to humans. On Arc AGI 2, the average human accuracy is around 60%. GPT 5.2x high was already near that human average level. Then Poetic pushed it from roughly human average territory to a solid 75%, which is basically moving from human baseline into clearly above. And the way Poetic got there is the bigger point. They didn't claim some magical model training breakthrough. They say they didn't train GPT 5.2 specifically for ARC. They're pushing the idea of meta-system architecture, meaning software-level system design, orchestration, building a system that knows how to call the model in the right way, step by step, until it solves the task. So you're not just watching models get bigger, you're watching systems get smarter. The leaderboard also shows Gemini 3 Deep Think Preview sitting in the mix scoring around 46%, noticeably behind the GPT 5.2 line, while costing slightly more. So you've got two things happening at once. Models are improving, and the systems wrapped around those models are multiplying performance. And this is where OpenAI's own language gets really interesting, because they're leaning hard into this term, capability overhang. They basically acknowledge that models are already capable of way more than people are pulling out of them. There's a gap between what the models can do and how humans actually use them. The bottleneck isn't raw intelligence anymore, it's the human side. Workflows, habits, integration, and the ability to turn raw capability into real results. So what do you think is more dangerous ChatGPT knowing your medical history or ChatGPT knowing how to do your entire job? Leave a comment because this is gonna split people hard. Hit like, subscribe. Thanks for watching, catch you in the next one.